Good morning, brothers and sisters. It's good to see you here this morning in the Lord's house. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice, rejoice and be glad, glad in it. Take just, just a second to think about something good that the Lord has brought into your life. We can get stuck in patterns of thinking about all the bad things and overwhelmed. Paul, Philippians chapter 4 says, think about, think about the good things. Th think about things that are good and lovely and beautiful and noble. Think about the blessings that you have, not the problems that you have. They're there, okay? The Lord knows all about them. But think about the blessings. Think about the good things. I mean, one of those things is just the ability and the freedom to be here in the Lord's house today to worship, to worship. And I hope that you've come expecting to hear from the Lord. The Lord draws us together into his presence because the Lord speaks to us. It's not that the Lord spoke. The Lord is speaking. The Lord is speaking. We have his word and his spirit speaks to us in our hearts. Do you have a listening heart this morning? Have you come to hear from the Lord? He also wants to hear from us, of course. The Bible says, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. So as you hear from God, open your heart, prepare your heart to hear from him, and do your best by God's grace to lift your heart and to lift your voice. Uh, in praise and in thanksgiving to the Lord. That is why we are here. We are practicing and preparing for eternity when all God's people, not just the folks around Locust Grove, the saints around Locust Grove, and thank God there are other churches in Locust Grove and in Salina and Shoto and Pryor and Pegs and Rose Prairie. God's people are meeting all over, not just Oklahoma, but all over the world, all over the world. And one day, all those people th through all the ages are going to be gathered together. No separation. We will have Christ in common and we will praise and worship and serve Him forever and ever and ever. We're getting ready for that today. We're preparing for that. We're practicing for that. This is a foretaste, a foretaste of the glory that's going to be revealed. So, you may have rushed in here at the last minute. You may be wiping the sweat from your brow because are we going to make it? I don't know if we're going to make it in time. But you're here. And let's still our hearts and prepare our hearts to listen and to worship. Can you do that? We're so glad that you're here, especially if you're a guest here today. Uh, it's a special honor to have you here. Um, we have a conviction that you're here on purpose. You didn't just wander in here, but God has brought you here. For reason, for purpose, because God loves you. He knows everything that's going on in your life. Every thought, every problem, every victory. Everything about you. And he loves you. And it's pleasing to him that you're here today. And we're so thankful. It's an honor for us uh, that you're here uh, in this church to worship with us today. Okay? We uh, begin our services by taking one another's hands and praying the Lord's Prayer. Go ahead and take somebody's hand. We're going to pray the Lord's Prayer together. And as you do that, just listen. You'll notice that the table is prepared to receive the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion. When we remember what Christ has done for us, we remember that we are forgiven. And we look forward to his return when salvation and all of its fullness is going to come. If you are a Christian, if you're a Christian... You're, you are welcome to come to the Lord's table to receive the body and the blood. This is one table, not many tables. It's one table. We gather around one table as the family of God, all equal in His sight because of what Christ has done. If you're a Christian, we invite you to come to the Lord's table. We'll do that after the sermon here in just a little while. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for being so good. You can't help but be good because you are good. And you are love and you are light and you are life. 
and you love us with an everlasting love. And we're overwhelmed by that. We don't, we don't understand why because we know ourselves in all that we've done. But your grace is greater than our sin. Your love is an everlasting love. And you have loved us by sending your only son for us. We're thankful for the salvation we have in him. Pray, Lord, for the Lee Briggs family, for Brent and Kelly and Sherry and their families, that you give them grace as we prepare for the funeral tomorrow. We pray, Lord, that uh, through this time of mourning, people would hear a, a word of hope and promise that there is eternal life ahead. But Lord, you know that in this congregation, there are folks who are struggling fighting hard battles. Many of them feel like they're alone. Nobody understands, nobody knows. We thank you for Jesus who knows and understands all that we have been through and all that we're going through. That, that he has bore our burdens and bore our sins. And he is with us through all of it. Never leaves us and never forsakes us. We thank you, Lord, for, for your goodness. We love you. We love you because you loved us first. Because you are our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Would you stand and let's sing together.
Grace is amazing.
deeper than my feet could ever wander My faith would be made stronger in the presence of my Savior Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders Let me walk upon the waters wherever you Hebrews chapter 10. Thank you, Ashley, for that beautiful song. I'm sorry you had to sing with our backup pianist today. Lord has blessed us so much. Thank you, Haley. We're glad the Lord brought you to Locust Grove. Such a blessing. Such a blessing. It's beautiful. I want to say thank you to Jason Bailey as well. I did not expect him to be back playing the guitar, playing the bass. He was having surgery. I don't know, about this time, one week ago, having his gallbladder taken out. And he's up here playing the bass guitar so well today. I think he played a little better before. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. He's fine-tuned now. He's fine-tuned. <laughs> Come to the last section of the central theological core of Hebrews. And next week we'll turn to the pastor as he um, encourages and exhorts and pleads with the people, uh, encourages them to keep on going in their walk with the Lord Jesus. Here he continues to talk about the high priestly ministry of Jesus, our Savior, our high priest, the Son of God. The title of the message is Never and Forever. Never the blood of bulls and goats, sacrifices offered day after day, year after year at the Jerusalem temple never could have perfected us, washed away our sin. But the sacrifice of Jesus shedding his blood, giving his body as an offering, for our sins so that we are sanctified, purified forever. That's the contrast in this passage. It would be easy to pass over this passage because the pastor has been over some of this before, but let's focus on some of the things that we that are new and that he brings to the forefront as he finishes up this section. 
What he wants us to know is that if, if we are forgiven, then, then we need to know for certain that we are forgiven. And, and to, to know it so that we can be set free from our sin and transformed. Forgiven and transformed into the image of his son. Are you forgiven? Do you know that you're forgiven? If you're in Christ, you're forgiven. If you're in Christ, you are forgiven. So, Pastor, you don't know what I've done. If you're in Christ, you're forgiven. Because if you're in Christ, it is his righteousness, not your own, that you're robed with. If you're in Christ, you're forgiven of all of your sins, made perfect by the perfect, forever, once and for all, sacrifice of Jesus. If you're in Christ, you are forgiven. And you need to know that. And it'll transform your life when you know that you're forgiven. That's what our pastor wants to drive home here with all the force that he can. We're going to receive Holy Communion this morning. We're going to receive the cup, the blood, the bread, the body of the Lord Jesus, which reminds us again and again and again and again that we're forgiven. You're forgiven. You're forgiven. That's why we receive the body and the blood again and again and again to remind us you're forgiven. You're forgiven. You're forgiven. Remember what Christ has done for you. You are forgiven of all of your sin. And that should bring us joy and peace and victory no matter what we face in life. So he is still showing us how Jesus and his work is the fulfillment of all of the law. We have this Old Testament in our Bibles and it talks about all the things that they had to do priests and the sacrifices and all of the rituals, all of those things pointing forward to Jesus and are fulfilled in him. And that was always their purpose. And finally, he wants you to know what? You are forgiven. You are forgiven. Verse 1, for since the law has but a shadow of the things to come, in Colossians chapter 2, Paul also calls the law and all of its ordinances, the dietary, the Sabbath, all of those circumcision, all those things, those also are a shadow. Here he's talking about the ministry of the priests and the sacrifices, also a shadow. They're a shadow of the good things to come. Now, to come was from the perspective of the law. They are here now. They're not future now. They have come. The law is but a shadow of the good things to come. Instead of the true form, the word there is icon. We got a word icon from it. Jesus is the image of God. The law is but a shadow. Instead of the icon, the form of the realities. Therefore, it can never, by the same sacrifices which are continually offered year after year, it could never make perfect, that is bring into a reconciled relationship with God, could never make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, he says, just think about it, otherwise, wouldn't they have ceased to be offered if they were effective? If the worshipers had once been cleansed, they would no longer have any consciousness of sin. They would realize they are forgiven. But instead, in these sacrifices, notice this church, in these sacrifices, day after day, year after year, there is a reminder, a reminder of sin, year after year. For it's impossible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. Would you pray with me? Prepare our hearts to hear the word of God. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your grace that is ours by faith in Christ alone. Pray that your spirit would remind us again 
so that we know it for certain that we are forgiven in your Son. If there's someone here today, Lord, that's not in Christ, has not turned to Jesus, your Son, the repentance of sins and faith, trusting in his finished work for salvation, that they would do that today. They would even right now begin to feel the pull of your beautiful, tender spirit in their lives. Know that you love them, that you know everything about them, everything. All the sins, all the secrets, everything, and you love them. You're calling them to yourself. In Jesus' name, amen. So the sacrifices in the whole system, think about the Jerusalem temple that stood for so long. Think about the, bull, the bulls and the goats and the lambs day after day, year after year, brought to the temple, brought to the temple, slaughtered, their blood shed, some burned on the altar. They were never able to take care of sin. They were always, always, always a shadow. It doesn't mean it was bad. Does it mean as a Christian we look back on the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, and say, oh, that was bad, now this is good. That's not what it says. They were a shadow of the good things to come. It was good. Did what it was intended to do. It was good. Why? Because it pointed to the perfect. All those things pointed to Jesus year after year. Now, one of the things that our family has done when we go to Disney World, Keith and Debbie did this a long time ago, back in the late 1900s, when they went to the Disney World and took Katie and Jenny <laughs> to Disney World. They got these little silhouettes made. Maybe you have those. Go ahead and go to the next picture back there, Gary. You recognize those people? It's amazing to me that I and Jenny and Keith and Jack and Julia can, can turn to the side and this artist can just take a black piece of paper and take a pair of scissors and cut out just like that and here it is a silhouette a silhouette is a lot like a shadow it's the form you can see what it is if you know the reality then you recognize the shadow if you had the shadow or the silhouette then you could maybe recognize us but we really know the silhouette because you know the reality you recognize those because you recognize us. Are those silhouettes bad? <laughs> There's something wrong with them? No. But the silhouette is not the same as us. It points to us. Hopefully you don't prefer the silhouette to us. <laughs> that would be silly, wouldn't it? They're a sign that points to a greater reality with so much more life. So many more dimensions. So much more detail. For good or bad. So much more detail. And we, I and Jenny and Keith and Jack and Julie, can actually do something for you. We can help you. We can be a blessing in your lives. And we, we want to be. I hope that we are. You can have a relationship with us. You can have a relationship with this silhouette that's in my office. The law sacrificial system it was always 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 just a silhouette just a shadow that always pointed forward to the substance to Jesus and all of those shadows of the Old Testament were fulfilled are fulfilled in him in him notice it says in verse 1 is a shadow the law is a shadow and then it says what it cannot do since it's merely a shadow it can never supply perfection because it's just a silhouette. It's just a shadow. What can it do? It can't do anything. But what it is, it is a shadow. Therefore, it's limitations. What it can do, it can never perfect. The old covenant could never, no matter how many bulls, how many goats, how many lambs, could never, never, never forgive sin. It could never. That's not what it was intended to do. I've said this before. We're not looking back and criticizing. We're thinking about its purpose. They were never able to do what they were never intended to do. And in God's providence, in His miraculous, beautiful, providential unveiling and revealing of His Word, these are pointing forward to Jesus. They have a function to fulfill. They were intended to point forward, not to perfect forever. 
And that's what they do. So they could never perfect the sinner. They always pointed to the Savior. They reminded us of our sin. They could never remove our sin. But the blood of Jesus and the broken body of Jesus does remove our sin forever and ever and ever and ever. The old covenant sacrifices don't remove, they remind. It's the opposite of what we need in a sense. We need our sins to be removed. But first, we do need to be reminded over and over, don't we? To know that we need our sins to be removed, we have to be reminded. We, we have a sin problem. It needs to be removed. The, have you ever been so ashamed that you're afraid to come to your mom and dad I don't want to come into their presence. I don't want to be in the same room. I'm going to stay in my room. I'm going to shut the door. I'm going to turn off the lights. I'm so ashamed of what I've done. I have this guilt and this shame. This consciousness of sin that I'm not forgiven is the great barrier to us coming to God freely with joy and peace into the presence of God. Remember Adam and Eve hiding behind the trees, hiding in the bushes in shame and the shame of sin. So this consciousness of sin that I have this guilty conscience needs to be removed. And this is what he says that the blood of Jesus does. Removes this so that we know I'm forgiven by the blood of Jesus. Not because of me, by the blood of Jesus. And I can come into the presence of God and experience joy and peace and comfort. And I can come with confidence. Never, the blood of bulls and goats could never do that. But the blood of Jesus and the broken body of Jesus does this forever. Forever. So now, no matter how many, what if we brought another bull, a better bull, a, another goat, a better goat, a sheep? What if we brought another one? Would that do it? No, got to come back the next day, next day. No matter how many, no matter how pure, no matter how long, never, 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 never impossible. And notice in chapter 7, verse 27, he says day after day. Here he says year after year. Day after day, year after year. Never could accomplish what only the blood of Jesus could. Now, what is the point of having a type or a shadow before the reality? I've hinted, it, hinted uh, you to it just a moment ago already. Why did we need a shadow? Why did we need a type before the reality? Well, part of the reason is because we needed to know the seriousness of sin. Understand the, understanding the radical nature of grace helps us to understand how bad sin was, how bad sin is. We needed to know the seriousness of sin, what sin has the power to do. The wages of sin is what, church? Death. Sin is serious. How it makes us slaves. What it has the power to do. And until we understand that, can we really understand, Grace, how sin destroys our lives and our communities and our families? The Jewish monarchy, the kings that they had, Saul, David, Solomon, all the way through, God told them at the very beginning, this is, going to be a, this is a bad idea and it's going to be a disaster. But since you're asking for a king, I'm going to give you a king. And you're going to have hundreds of years under the heavy hand of a king. And this king is going to take, 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 take everything you have when you give him that power. The monarchy is nothing more than a protracted illustration of what you get when you reject God as king. You're not going to have the king that you need until my son comes and doesn't take anything from you, but he gives, he gives, he gives. The sacrifices of the old covenant are like that. Year after year after year after year after year, they're reminding, reminding, reminding us of how bad sin is and what the price of it is. It's kind of like when a dad catches a son smoking a cigarette, you know. He's hiding out in the, in the, in the building out there, and he catches him smoking a cigarette. And what is the punishment? Or what, what does he do to teach him not to smoke? Puts him in the bathroom, shuts the door, shuts the windows, and said, Here, you, don't, you cannot come out until you smoke the entire pack of cigarettes. Because you need to know what this does. You need to know what this is. This is what is best for you. Oh, if you remember the movie, The Fighting Sullivans, that's what, the, that's what the dad did in that movie, okay? This is what was necessary year after year after year. 
until we understand the seriousness of sin, we won't appreciate the greatness of grace. That's the point that I'm making here, okay? Now notice we sang Amazing Grace this morning. Did you notice that? Did you enjoy that? I love the new songs, but man, I love the old songs the best. Maybe it's because I'm almost 50. I don't know. When I came, I was a young man, and I don't know what happened, but I'm not anymore. But the point is, we sang Amazing Grace. That's probably the best love Christian song ever in the history of the world. Okay? Our greatest song is Amazing Grace. The greatest Christian song is not about how terrible a sinner you are. We don't come here each week, hopefully, to remind ourselves what wretched, terrible sinners we are. Rather, it's about God's grace and how wonderful and radical the grace of God is. I'll come back around to that when we get closer to the end. Look at verse 5. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, now he's quoting Psalm 40 here. The Psalm of David. When Christ came into the world, and what he's saying is that the words of David, David was speaking prophetically, and this is what Jesus says as he comes into the world. Sacrifices and offerings thou hast not desired, but a body thou hast prepared for me. A body. In burnt offerings and sin offerings thou hast taken no pleasure. Then, I said, lo, I have come to do thy will, O God. This is Jesus speaking. God has given him a body in order to be obedient to the will of God. As it is written of me in the role of the book, all the Old Testament is about Jesus. When he said above, thou hast neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, these are offered according to the law. Let me just stop right there. I was talking to my best friend, Wes Holland. He sent me a Marco Polo last night asking me something about his sermon that he's probably preaching right now. They're an hour ahead. He's probably finished preaching. Don't you wish you were in Gardner, Maine right now? (laughs) And so I said, hey, I'm preaching Hebrews tomorrow. You got any thoughts on that? He said, you know, when I was a teenager, I was laying in bed. And for some reason I thought, why? Why did we ever stop doing sacrifices? What was the point of sacrifices? And offerings like it's at the temple. He's a teenager. Kids. And he said, something just out of the blue said to me, Hebrews 10.8. He said, I never read the book of Hebrews before in my life. Didn't know a thing about it. But I was wondering about sacrifices and offerings in the Old Testament. Why did I wonder that? I don't know. It's Hebrews 10.8. He opened up and he read just what I read to you right there. What are the chances that was an accident? He said he didn't understand really anything Hebrews 10.8 had to say. He knew it was an answer to his question. He wouldn't understand the answer until later. But he knew this. There's a God who's listening to me and cares about me. Intimately. is watching over my life. How can a 14 year old wonder? What about these sacrifices? And a word comes to his consciousness. Hebrews 10.8, he opens it up to a verse about sacrifices and offerings. God knows what's going on in your life. He knows all of your questions. He has answers to all of your questions. Whether you understand the answer right now or not, he knows you and he loves you and he cares about your questions. He cares about your pursuit of him. I thought that was pretty amazing. Then he added, Lo, I have come to do thy will. This is Jesus speaking. So he abolishes the first, that is the sacrifice and offerings, in order to establish the second, that is the Son of God receiving a body incarnate and offering his body as an offering for sin. And by that will, that is the will of God, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So Citation of Psalm 40. The order matters. Notice he says, above it is said, he's citing the first part of that, sacrifices and offerings you did not desire. And he says, notice in Psalm 40, it says, then a body you've given me. 
So the sacrifices and offerings are abolished when the Son of God receives a body, becomes flesh, and offers His body in obedience to the will of God for the sins of the world. And he says, Psalm 40, look, David said this so long ago. This is exactly what has happened. This is a prophecy of Jesus. It perfectly illustrates his point. The author of Hebrews, the pastor, is an ab- absolutely outstanding Bible reader. We need to learn how to read the Bible from him. Notice in this passage, did you notice a couple of times he said, offerings and offerings and offerings and offerings, and then a couple of verses later, offerings and offerings and offerings and offerings and offerings, this kind of offering, that kind of offering, this kind of offering, whole burnt offerings, all the kinds of offerings could never do away with sin. It, he just he piles those up to reinforce the point that he's making there. Notice how many times offerings is in the text. Day after day, year after year, offering after offering. I love what Warren Wiersbe has to say. He says, the ministry of the priests in the tabernacle in the temple was never done. It was never different. We got to do it again tomorrow. What are we doing tomorrow? Same thing we did yesterday. Same thing. Forever. They thought. The constant repetition was proof that their sacrifices did not take away sins. Got to do it again tomorrow? Why is that? Our sins are still here. What tens of thousands of animal sacrifices could not accomplish, Jesus accomplishes with one sacrifice, one offering forever. Therefore, you are forgiven if you're in Christ. Now again, this is not Christians looking back on the Old Testament saying, oh, the Old Testament's no good. This is embedded in the Old Testament. He's quoting from Psalm 40. David said this a long time ago. It's in the historical books. It's in the Psalms. It's in the prophets. It's not a Christian critique. It's right there in the Old Testament itself. Notice Amos 5, 21 through 24. You guys know this passage. Notice how it's in the prophets. I, God says, I hate, I despise your feasts. And I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and your cereal offerings... I will not accept them. The peace offerings of your fatted beasts, I will not look upon. Take away the noise of your song. So imagine we're singing hymns this morning. Imagine God in heaven going like this. I cannot listen to another song. Why? Verse 24. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Quit bringing me your sacrifices. Love your neighbor. This is what I'm going to be pleased with. That's in the prophets. The best-known passage is when Saul was told, wait until Samuel gets there, do what I say, and then offer sacrifice, then you can go to battle. But Saul couldn't wait, couldn't obey. I'm going to offer sacrifice anyway to make sure I win this battle. He disobeyed the word of God. And this is what 1 Samuel 15 says. Samuel said, has the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? In the Hebrew Psalm 40, it says, the Lord has dug out my ear, dug out an ear for me. In the Greek version and in... Hebrews, which is quoting from the Greek version, I don't want to get you confused here, it says that he has given me a body. In the Hebrew, he has given me an ear to hear the word of God and the will of God so that with my whole body I will obey him. So the Holy Spirit is interpreting this and helping us to understand the implication of digging out an ear. Obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, have you ever heard this before? To obey is better than than sacrifice and to hearken to the Lord than the fat of rams. Here's the deal. Jesus obeyed the will of God perfectly. Obedience is always an act of self-sacrifice. It's way easier to sacrifice a bull or a goat or a lamb from the flock than it is to obey and sacrifice myself. It's not that God is against sacrifice, but the sacrifice is meaningless unless the person is giving it. First has given himself to God. God gave Jesus a body. Jesus laid down his body in sacrifice for our sins on our behalf. And when you are forgiven, this is what the Bible says. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies 
as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. So, big picture, taking a step back, not the sacrifices of animals, but the sacrifice of the body of the obedient son. You have given me a body to obey. So God gave the eternal son a body, flesh and blood body, to obey his will. And God's will was to save the world through the sacrifice of his son as his body suffered and died. The once for all, forever sacrifice of the son is the reality that all those Old Testament sacrifices pointed forward to. They were never the point, but they were always pointing. You've given me a body, Jesus says in Psalm 40. This is really important because some people would, the importance of the body, some people would say, I know in my heart, I have a good heart, and it's the heart that matters. It doesn't matter what I do with my body. Of course it matters what you do with your body. God has given you your body as a temple of the Holy Spirit to serve Him, to bring glory to Him. What we do with our bodies reveals our hearts. And Jesus sacrificed His body with much pain and suffering and patient endurance. Now I just want you to notice this before we move on to the next section. Jesus came to do the Father's will. That set the agenda for His life. You need to let that set the agenda for your life. The agenda for Jesus' life was not set by the needs of people. Jesus goes to the pool of Siloam, heals one guy, not everybody. This was the Father's will. And I can't be dragged in every direction, even as your pastor, by running around trying to be everything to everybody all the time. I can't do it, neither can you. Jesus did the will of the Father. You need to do the will of the Father as well. What is the will of the Father for you? Verse 11, And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, then to wait until his enemies should be made a stool for his feet, for by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. We've talked about the Father, the Son, now the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. You remember what Paul said in Romans? The Spirit bears witness to our spirit that we are the sons of God and daughters of God. Here the Holy Spirit bears witness to us. For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts. They'll know they belong to God. I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their misdeeds, when? No more. You need to get a hold of that this morning. Where there's forgiveness of these, there's no longer any offering for sin. It's unnecessary. Forgiven. Notice what he says about the body of Jesus. He told us that the body was given by God, this body that suffered and died for our sins. It was given by God. It was offered for our sins. Here it says, this resurrected body of Jesus was seated in heaven where he rules and reigns, makes intercession for us, seated in heaven until all of his enemies are defeated. That's what's happening right now. All the enemies of the Lord Jesus Christ are being placed under his feet by God. Now, I want you to take a step back again here for just a second, my free will Baptist brothers and sisters. Because if you were like me growing up, you struggled with this. In Christ, you are forgiven forever. That is a radical statement. In Romans 5 and 6, Paul says, Where sin abounded, grace did abound all the more. Paul was accused of being an antinomian. Do you know what an antinomian is? That means anti-law. He was accused of saying that if you are forgiven Go and sin all you want and, have, and just go out and get drunk and have fun and run around and be a total heathen because then God's grace will abound and God will be glorified. Now here's what I want to say to you. I heard this from someone else. If as a pastor I'm not sometimes accused of being an antinomian, I'm not preaching grace good enough. Because Paul was accused of being anti-law because he preached grace so hard. People said, wait a minute, that doesn't sound right. 
Notice in chapter 5, verse 19 and following in Romans. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. The law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Can you say that with me? Where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. His grace is greater than our sin. So that, as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In chapter 6, verse 1, he says, Shall we sin that grace may abound? He says, No, 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 that's not the point. It's not that you sin so that grace may abound so that God will get more glory. It's that when God forgives our sin by His wonderful, matchless, boundless grace... We are not only forgiven, but when we know we're forgiven, we are transformed by that grace. God's grace doesn't only forgive, God's grace transforms our lives. And God is glorified. But, again, if we're not accused of being lawless antinomians, we're not preaching grace enough. There's a finality of the forgiveness in Christ. I'm going to read to you, I don't like to do this, but it's so good. This is Thomas Long, and what he is saying is, even today in Baptist churches, in Christian churches, it can be like every Sunday is the Day of Atonement again and again. We're just reminded of sins every week. Do you hear me? In Christian churches, it can feel like the Day of Atonement. We're just reminded of our sin every time, every week, every week, every week. He says, most contemporary Christians do not, of course, observe the Day of Atonement. But many know the underlying reality being reminded, often churches are far more effective in preaching sin than they are of proclaiming grace. Sunday after Sunday, month after month, year after year, sermon after sermon, beats out the message of sin. Every Sunday is the day of atonement, but sadly, an atonement we must accomplish for ourselves. The sacrifices placed on the altar are those of the unfortunate congregation who have come to be told one more time, you don't measure up. And because this is the constant theme, they become convinced they will never measure up. If you think you can never measure up, you're probably just going to give up. We, tr we try to absolve our guilt by bringing sacrifices with us. Listen to me, my free will Baptist brothers and sisters. We repeatedly bring sacrifices. Lord, didn't I give of myself generously to serve as an advisor to the youth group? Is that enough? Lord, didn't you hear me pray for the sick in our church? Was that good enough? Did that earn your grace? Lord, didn't you notice how I stood up for someone in my company? Was that enough? Lord, at least I come to church. A lot of people don't even come to church. Doesn't that count? Lord, is that enough? Is that enough? I know I'm a sorry, no good, dirty, rotten sinner, but Lord, is that enough? Over and over we make these offerings does not work it's never enough never adequate so we keep our distance from the holy of holies leave with a guilty conscience and come back next week with another basket of good intentions and deeds to place on the altar or we just stay away altogether uh, if, if that has been your experience in church I, I'm sorry if it has been I pray and I hope I don't think it has been here but I, I have experienced that myself if you're in Christ, your sins are forgiven. Forgiven. I'm going to skip some of that because we need to get to communion. It says all of his enemies are being placed under his feet. Do you see that happening? Do you see that happening? What does that look like? It, it, is, it is a quiet thing. It is, a, it is not a coercive thing. Some of you need to come to the Lord Jesus Christ today and make Him your Lord and Savior and have all your sins forgiven forever. And when you do that, an enemy is being placed under His feet. It is your sin has been forgiven, overcome. But He, he, he doesn't do this in a coercive way. Jesus is not going to force you 
to repent or turn to him in faith. It is a quiet thing. How quietly, how quietly. But listen to me. But just before we come, I'm going to read a poem. And just before we come to the table, you need to have this deep confidence that one of these days, all of the enemies of the perfect Lord Jesus Christ are going to be placed under his feet. All of them, all of them, all of them. It's not up to you. It's not your job. It's going to happen because he is the King of kings and Lord of lords. It's not going to be loud. It's going to be quiet. That's the way he comes to us. Listen to this poem about the Lord's table, about communion by Oxford scholar Malcolm Geit. Think about you're going to come and receive the bread and receive the cup and how Jesus comes to us in this way. The bread is light, dissolving, almost air. A little visitation on my tongue. A wafer-thin sensation, hardly there. This taste of wine is brief in flavor, flung a moment to the palate's roof and fled. Even its aftertaste, a memory. Yes, this is how he comes. Through wine and bread, love chooses to be emptied into me. He does not come in unimagined light, too bright to be denied, too absolute for consciousness, too strong for sight, leaving the seer blind and the poet mute. He chooses instead to seep into each one into each sense, to die himself into experience. Would you bow your heads with me? The Lord is coming to you in this way right now. This one who became flesh and gave his body as a once and for all sacrifice for your sins. He is here. And he comes to us today in tenderness and love and in great victory and power to remind us again we belong to him. I'm going to ask Haley to come and play for just a moment as we prepare our hearts to come to the Lord's table. If you are in Christ, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. God is your Father. Jesus is your Savior. prepare your heart to come to the Lord's table? Do you know that you belong to him? This one who came as a little baby became a king by dying on the cross for your sins. Do you know that your sins are forgiven? As you receive the bread and as you receive the cup, these emblems, these symbols of his presence, Take them into yourself. Can you remember how he has knocked upon the door of our hearts, has come to us quietly to save us forever? Are you prepared to come to the Lord's table? And he said, take and eat. This is my body, my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I shall not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day forward to that day when I drink it anew with you 
in my Father's kingdom. Father, thank you for the forgiveness we have in your Son. Give us peace and comfort and great joy and thanksgiving as we come again to remember that we are forgiven forever. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Deacons, would you come and prepare the elements as God's people have prepared their hearts? To prepare the bread and the cup. stand if you're able to stand and come to the Lord's table to one table all of God's people whoever you are wherever you've come from whatever you've done all those who are in Christ come to the Lord's table and remember
God says in 1 Corinthians 11, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us remember the body of our Lord Jesus, broken for us all. In the same way, also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us remember together the blood of our Lord Jesus shed for all of us for the forgiveness of all of our sins forever. Our Father in heaven, we give you thanks and we give you praise for what you have done for us through your Son. Lord Jesus, thank you for becoming one of us, for living a sinless life, showing us the way, for dying on the cross for our sins, shedding your blood for us and giving your body. We praise you for you rose from the dead and live forevermore. We thank you that you are praying for us right now that you're coming back for us. We can't wait. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Brother Bailey, come on up. As he's coming up, you can sit down. All right. Well, hey, thank you for all the prayers and calls and texts and all those things. Uh, I'm healed. Um, no, I really appreciate it. Makes, makes us feel loved and uh, going through some of those uh, wild times, right? Um, right after I come out of surgery, it was a, I mean, I was having surgery when you guys were having church last week, um, and uh, come out and, you know, friends and family were there, and then Jeff and Jenny showed up shortly after, and so appreciate you guys for showing up. I do need to apologize publicly for Jenny to what I said when I was still on a lot of pain medicine. Right after surgery, my wife recommended that I apologize to you <clears throat> for what I said. I'm sorry. All right. Uh, this, we got an action-packed October. Uh, we have uh, this Wednesday is a Wednesday night fellowship meal. That's right. We're having uh, some incredible, uh, the meatloaf meal. Tim and Sarah are making us a meatloaf meal unlike you've ever had. Uh, and then, of course, uh, next Sunday, we have a Senior Saints Luncheon, so you're going to want to be here for that if you're a Senior Saint. Uh, we also have the Women's Gathering the week after, the 20th, um, so that'll be, I think there's details in there, Amanda Walsh's uh, home, uh, as well as the week after, we have our Fall Festival at the Stokes. That's always an exciting thing. If you've not gone before, you're going to want to be there, lots of fun games and food and, and all kinds of exciting things for family. Great, wholesome family fun there. Uh, and then, of course, Trunk or Treat is October 30th. So lots of things going on in October. If you're not getting plugged in, involved, this is me inviting you to all these things, okay? So you can't say, I wasn't invited, all right? So I'm inviting you to all these things, um, and uh, we'd love to have you come out and participate in all those fun ex activities for the month of October. Thank you, Brother Jason. Jenny wants you to know you're forgiven of all your sins. <laughs> Would you stand? Stand with me. Receive the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine down upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, both now and forevermore. Amen. You are dismissed. Amen.